I've never really considered myself much of a collector, but then one game came along and basically changed all of that. It's a Japanese survival horror game from 1999 for the Sega Dreamcast, and it's called D2. And it's responsible for two things. My obsession with collecting other Japanese cult horror games and learning that retro games in Japan are so damn cheap. Do a search on eBay for D2 and you will see just how expensive that game can go for. The Japanese version, on the other hand, goes for just mere dollars. And it ain't just D2. Whether it's the Clock Tower series, Echo Knight, Ill Bleed, Enemy Zero, you name it, there's always one consistent thing. The American ones are stupid expensive when the Japanese ones are just ridiculously cheap. The thing is, I became absolutely consumed in trying to understand this ridiculous price gap. And I think there's a few reasons to explain it. And what better way to kick this all off than going to the source. I'm Kurt, and I have never been to Japan until today. This was my first time here and I was completely alone. And while I was here to work, in my downtime, my agenda was simple. Wander aimlessly, eat, and of course, go shopping for video games. And where better to start than Japan's electronic district, Akihabara. Games were everywhere, and I mean like everywhere. There was bins just out in the streets filled with video games. And when I did finally walk into a video game store, it had only been a matter of minutes until I found everything I had been obsessing over. And yes, they were, by American standards, incredibly cheap. Not to mention, a lot of these games were complete in their box and sealed. D2 was right next to Seaman, and oh, there was also a copy of D's Diner on the 3DO sealed, and yes, I bought it. From this experience, just being able to walk into one store after the other and see a multitude of these games. Of course, the first and most obvious speculation was mass production. These games were made for a Japanese audience. They were likely to be more popular in Japan. Therefore, more copies of them were made than they were in North America, which is a totally reasonable thing to speculate. But there is something else that stood out to me while I was there that wasn't just mass production. The culture of physical media. So considering the amount of shops I've been in so far, including the bookstore that I just aimlessly wandered into, this store felt like it had thousands of movies, of DVDs to choose from. And when I realized it was rental, something that is basically extinct in the States, it made me start thinking about this entire idea of why games could be cheaper a little differently here. Whether it's consoles toppled on top of each other or endless rows of games and movies, it didn't feel novel or like something to be coveted. They sort of felt meaningless, but not in the way that like they don't matter, but rather just how I'm used to seeing games treated here in the States, which are often like collector's items. In fact, the closest thing or feeling I can relate it to actually is secondhand bookstores. Walking through game stores in Japan is a stark contrast to what it feels like to walk into a game store in America. It felt more like I was rummaging through places like this. It's the same feeling. It's a place filled with hundreds of books from classics to obscure ones, most of which you can buy for a few bucks. Just books upon books stacked on top of each other or found in bins on the street. Like games in Japan, the value isn't in what the price tag says, it's what's in the pages. It's what's in the case, which ties back to exactly what sent me down this rabbit hole in the first place. I didn't want D2 because it was a collector's item or because it was expensive. I wanted it because I have an infatuation with its writer, director, and composer, Kenji Ina. Every game this dude has made is off kilter and unconventional in its design, and D2 was no exception. It was also his last major game that he wrote, directed, and composed before he died in 2013. On the back of the case of D2, it says, a terrifying adventure unlike anything ever experienced. And you know what? It is absolutely right. 
Its pacing is slow and brooding, its horror is brash and intense, and yet the combat is almost arcadey. It is a hodgepodge of ideas. And while it may not work for everyone, it certainly landed with me. Because, like the back of the case says, I will likely never play a game like this from a AAA studio from a major publisher ever again. And it was these experiences that got me excited over the idea of collecting new and weird and wacky things. The value in me owning it was as sort of like a symbol or an ode to an artist that I deeply respected. And in turn, it also inspired me to want to find more games like it that were often older, Japanese, and extremely expensive. And aside from being expensive, all the games I've mentioned have one other specific thing in common. They're apparently like not that good. And you know what? I don't care. Being in Japan for a short time and being able to get that first-hand experience of how easy these games were to track down, it honestly kind of bummed me out. You would think there would be at least one retro game store in San Francisco. They exist just outside of the city. And if I wanted to go to one, I'd have to get in the car and drive for around an hour to get to any of them. And guess what? This guy doesn't have a car. When in comparison, games in Tokyo just seem to be culturally infused. Nearly anywhere I wandered in the city, it didn't take long to just find a store that sold games. It really gave me a chance to see just how differently games seem to be viewed here because that's what has sunk in. In the States, games are treated like baseball cards, like collectibles, like flipped sneakers. And I mean that literally. There's a flea market I go to every single month and without fail, there are always vendors selling all of those things every single time I go. In some cases, the sellers didn't entirely know the value of what they were selling. They just knew that games were valuable. And that's where I keep coming back to this juxtaposition. The games found at flea markets in these vacant parking lots that are just astronomically expensive by my standards versus the games I found on the streets of Tokyo that look like they've been kicked around and for a fraction of the price. And specifically, I'm kind of referring to that sun bleached copy of Super Mario 64, something that can be bought by someone for just a few bucks and cherished the same exact way I cherish some of my favorite books that look like they've been ran over and kicked down the street 600 times. Both of which, the game and the books I'm referring to, have probably been played or read, sold, and rebought a dozen times. Now, putting cultural reasons aside why we're in the situation we're in concerning the prices of games really stems from the game grading bubble that inflated in 2021 when WADA Games, a grading company, sold a copy of Super Mario Brothers for $2 million. And when that happened, despite game grading being a whole beast in of itself, the public eye saw a headline that saw a game that sold for $2 million, and therefore the general public view of games was that they were valuable, that they were expensive, alongside comic books and beanie babies and coins or whatever else people decide to collect. Which is how we end up with people selling boxed Sega Saturns at flea markets for $600. When in comparison, when I was in Japan, every single game store I walked into had walls made of consoles for sale that were at affordable prices. I'm pretty sure I saw like a Dreamcast for like 40 bucks. Also, it was only days before I started searching to purchase D2, which means that Super Mario Brothers copy sold. And then I just was like, I just want my weird little game. And that's of course when the price skyrocketed. And a good way to actually like visually see how all this happened is a site called pricecharting.com, which accumulates all of the sold versions of a game. And then you can actually see the actual chart of when these games skyrocketed in price in 2021. All that being set aside, it's not like I'm trying to say it's worth going to Japan just because games are so much cheaper to buy. Instead, this whole thing gave me the opportunity to reflect on my relationship with collecting and why I even collect in the first place. For every single person, there's going to be a very specific, likely intimate reason as to why they collect the things they collect. That could be for nostalgia, that could be for preserving the medium, it could even be a sign of their identity, how they even represent themselves as a person. In my case, I collect a lot of things I collect either to honor a specific artist because that thing had some sort of influence on who I am, or, you know, I just, like to preserve those lost gems that I think are culturally interesting, even though you know they're not considered great games, but that's just me. 
If there's one thing I can at least confirm is that Japan just does not have a retro gaming bubble like the one we do. But all of this, that's just my perspective. You let me know what you think. Yeah.